the only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. We have forgotten about the authenticity of God's creation, not man's creation. Mankind is about to get an eviction notice because they've turned totally against the living God in their ways, in how they worship and what they worship with their idols. And you know what? All of us had been a part of that once, but we were called out of death itself, out of darkness into the marvelous light. And the Lord God says, anybody who denies that is a liar. That's a hard hitting one, right? It's very tough to sit there and, and, and say to someone, I was a child of wrath. But see, that's what the Lord said. He bought us from death to life. We were once children of wrath, but now we have become real children. You know what I'm fighting? Pride. Pride does not like this conversation to be told this way. You know who occupies spaces of pride? Devils. That word devil is a title implying something against the word of God. That's what a devil is. A devil is a title, not necessarily an entity, which is why that word devil and devils, plural, with another S, is used often in the word of God. People desire to be whole. They cannot be whole if they resist the fundamental words of the living God. If we deny how we began in the first place, no one's past should be an embarrassment, but a real testimony of how God can change a person from one thing to the other. So let me ask you something. What are people trying to establish utilizing the word of God? What are they doing? In fact, in prophecy, it foretells of what the church is doing. Then Jesus gives a warning. And do you not know we have been doing those very things? As, uh, like we couldn't help it. God prophesied to the seven churches. Why have we been doing exactly what's in the letters to the seven angels of the seven churches? Why? That's prophecy. But once you catch it, then you fight the good fight of faith against it. Not so you can be squeaky clean. Who's trying to not sin so they can just be clean and spotless in front of everybody? Who's doing that? Because I'm not. I care less if I'm spotless in front of everybody else. I'm going to be real and true to the living God for what he gave to us, which was his only begotten son, because he paid the highest price for me anybody could ever pay, not to impress somebody else. Oh, long are we going to continue to go down these exits of popularity in which it, they're broad exits they're not thin exits give me that narrow passage don't give me the broad gate don't give me the way that everybody follows oh, by the way don't come here and expect to hear anything that you want to hear because if i'm saying what you want to hear then you've already said it what are you here for what am i speaking for you ever think of that the well has not run dry in this place not because of me that's not what it means. This place is dedicated for the works of the Most High. It is not mine. It is not yours. It is the Most High's. It has no dictator. Our Father is the leadership. Because a person filled with the Holy Spirit is going to have the knowledge of God within themselves. The Lord will disclose things to them so long as the Spirit occupies them. You can read the Old Testament with the prophets when they did commune. When the Spirit was upon them in that moment, they knew everything. And in those moments, they wrote things down. Because God gave them understanding and clarity in those moments. Since Christ has come, He wrote things down within you. Oh, I love that. He wrote them down inside of you. Nobody can steal them. Nobody can take them away from you. They can take your paper Bible all day long. They are not removing the Word of God from you. See, because if you have the Spirit, it's impossible for you not to have the Word of God. Oh, and that's going to manifest so they can take anything they want. In this day and age, I notice a lot of people have forgotten, or maybe they don't know the power of the living God. There are a lot of people searching for the power of the living God. They are not familiar with His power. They are not familiar with it, which is why many are so discouraged. See, there's a discouragement going around among those who believe these days. They're discouraged because they've gotten in a habit of having resources or things before them, and if it's not before them, they'll say they don't have it. That's not true concerning those things of God. All things of the living God, His truth was given 
How is this word given to us? God did not write the Bible and drop it on earth. It came by way of inspiration. It came by way of the Holy Spirit. That's how it came. So those who were filled with the Holy Spirit had this truth in them, and they wrote it down on paper or parchment or whatever they did. But at first, it came directly by the living God. He does the exact same thing today. But here's the principle. If God has supplied to you something, now listen to me, everybody. If God has given you something to do something with, don't expect him to give anything else to you until you exhaust what he's already given you. That's his principle. You can be in great need, but if you have not utilized what God has already given you, you're not going to get anything other than that because you're not utilizing what he has already given you. When God operates in your life, he operates by his principles of truth, not our principles, his principles of truth. Somebody says, how do you know for sure I have the Holy Spirit in me? There are times that my thoughts, I have doubted. Oh, it's in the Bible. Don't worry, we'll discuss that. It's in the Bible. We need not even guess about that because we have instruction concerning these things. We already have instruction. It's already been told to us. In fact, it's been outlined. And let me add this to it. There's no way when you're operating by the power of the Holy Spirit will you ever mistake it for anything else. It's just not going to happen. Now, keep this in mind. There are going to be times in your life you're going to feel devoid of the power of the Holy Spirit. It does not mean Christ is not there with you by the Holy Spirit because he said he would never leave you nor forsake you. But here's the key. If I renounce Christ, and, and folks, remember this, we always, we have been in this world for so long, we've forgotten some things. You ready for this? If I don't deny Christ with my mouth, that does not mean I did not denounce him. Do you guys understand? I can utter out of my mouth all day long, I love the Lord, and say nothing to the contrary. That does not mean I have not denounced Christ. When you denounce him, let me tell you what it looks like. I know in the word of God, the word of God says, love your enemies. That's what Jesus told us. The day I decide, having knowledge of that scripture, the day I decide, To hate my enemy is the day I have renounced Christ. See, to renounce Christ is to renounce what he said. To accept Christ is to accept what he said. You guys cannot accept me. That's impossible. You can accept my efforts towards you, or you can deny them. There is no me without my efforts. There is no you without your efforts. There's nothing to accept if you have done nothing. You guys understand? To renounce Christ is when he said he'd never leave you nor forsake you, but you sit there and say, he's not with me. That's denouncing him. Because to denounce his word, to call his word a lie, to call his word untrue is denouncing him. That's a uh oh moment. See, we often forget. We can fool each other with words. God looks beyond your words. He told us this coming out of his holy word over and over again. He was a discerner of the thoughts in the heart. So we can speak something all day. That doesn't mean a hill of beans until we start living it. You can claim anything all day. That's not going to mean nothing until you begin to prepare for it. To claim it is not to believe it. To claim it is simply to state you believe it. But to actually believe it is to make room for it. That's faith. So when you're walking around your house saying, I'm healed, but you've made no preparation for your healing, you're not believing it. You're just talking. You're talking to the air. That's no different than mumbling. Maybe the last person left listening to myself at the end of this. Oops, I don't listen to myself. Many people, they want things badly. They need something badly. We serve and have a father of truth. I never read where God would have such compassion on Satan that he would let him go free. I never read that. Did you? Did you guys read that? Never read that. I did read that when a thief was alive, he actually believed the Messiah, which revealed who he was truly on the inside. We're talking about a thief, a thief who just kept stealing. But he looked at Christ and he said, you are the Messiah. I believe what you said. The truth of him came to the surface. He was living like the world, but he saw the truth in the Messiah. One thief, one person had no idea. This thief 
believed, stood up for the Messiah because he could see who he was. And it's that recognition, that change of heart. You see, that changed his whole life in a fraction of a second on the cross. That one encounter to the point where Jesus said today, you will be with me in paradise. Can you imagine that? Many of you are hanging. You're being crucified by your circumstances. You know the one thing you have not done? This guy was hanging on a cross and in pain. But then did, what did he do? You guys know the story. What did he do? His circumstances had him pinned to a cross. But what did he do? He didn't go make a bunch of declarations. No. Nope. I'm going to tell you what he did. He did not deny Christ. He denied his circumstances. He denied his pain in that moment. Pain, he denied it so he could speak. He looked beyond his situation into the truth, and he denied giving his circumstances power over his life in that moment. And who did he give it to? Christ Jesus. See, for him to be in pain, being tortured, being crucified, and then to say, you are the Christ. You're him. You're the Messiah. I believe. You see, he denied everything in the world and believed the Messiah. Do you see that? See, because some of you, you're on a cross. Oh, you're on a cross. Yes, you are. See, that thief was on a cross. He was on a cross too. Well deserving of it. He was a thief. But some of you, you're not thieves. Not like that. But your circumstances have you pinned to a cross. And the one thing you have not done, because see, a lot of people get up on their crosses and what do they do? They start talking and they dwell upon the cross, how bad the cross hurts, how uncomfortable that cross is. Don't they? They just talk about the cross, talk about the cross. The one person, the person, the people who will stop talking about the cross and turn away from that whole cross, that crucifixion business, your circumstances and what it has done, the very person who turns and looks at the Messiah and says, you are the Messiah. He didn't ask the Messiah to get him off the cross. It's not what he asked him. He recognized him. He believed in him. You know what the action was? He did not glorify the cross he was on. He didn't talk about the cross he was on. He was a thief, but he recognized the Messiah. God demonstrated in that moment too. When you recognize the Messiah, it is God who removes your sin away. It is God who cleanses. Most people think they believe that comes by a procedure of some sort. No, it is your Father in heaven who washes away your sin. You don't wash away your sin. I don't wash away my own sin. But it's the Father who sent his Son for that. He removes your sin when you believe. See, because when you believe, the very thing you believe in is the very thing you're going to talk about. The very thing you believe in is the very thing you magnify. The very thing you believe in is the very thing you speak to someone else about every single day of your life. That's what you really believe. So we can talk about the Lord for years in this setting. But what else are we talking about? See, because it reveals what we're believing. Today, I kept hearing that the president is the most powerful man on earth. To them, maybe, the most powerful man on earth is the one that recognizes and does believe in the Messiah. When you believe in the Messiah, how do you do that? By believing what he said. If you don't know what he said, you can't believe. You know that, don't you? If you don't know what he said, you just know of him. You may even believe he existed, but you're not believing in him. You're not believing on him. See how different that is. Devils, they know he existed. They believe he exists, but they don't believe upon him. They don't really believe in him. Because if they believed in him, they would compliment what he spoke. And God said, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. But you look in the mirror and you say, I'm just, a, I should just die because I'm so terrible looking or whatever the case is. Don't you know you're rejecting your father in that moment? You know what you're saying? You're standing against him when you do that. And you're also talking like the world. And you're not trusting him. The Lord made you exactly how you are for a reason. Just because you don't understand that reason, why then would a person denounce it? And take the world's way, not God's way, but the world's way, and seek, because if I were to make myself look the best that I could, I'm not doing that for the living God. I'm doing that for people. Uh-oh, aren't I? Because I know that God can see beyond the flesh. I don't need to do all this extra stuff so that the Father can see me. He will see me, either clothed or not, no other way. He looks right through all of my flesh preparations, and he can see me 
But don't we do things so that other people can see us in a certain light? So why would a person condemn what God did? Because other people don't like it. You know, I read the Bible often, and every time I read the Word of God, those who do not believe in the Messiah, they don't like the people either. They always have something to say. If God gave you a house, would you tell God you don't like that house? Or if God gave you a place to go rest, put your family in, and as soon as you get in there, the roof cracks a little bit, would you curse the house or would you fix it? If God gave me a place to stay in and the roof started leaking, I would fix it. I would say thank you the whole time I'm fixing it because I would remember the time I did not have a house. Do you not know that you are a spiritual house? Maybe you didn't eat enough. Maybe you ate too much. Listen to me. Be thankful for the right reasons, for the true reasons. You can't do anything for humanity outside of your flesh. You can't do anything outside of your flesh. Once you pass from this realm, you're no good to everybody else. You can't do anything. You're not going to come back. You're not going to come back and start helping people out free of your own pain and situations. No, you're going to be out of the fight. You can't reach anybody else. Don't put you in that house. If the leak is, if the roof is leaking, be thankful for it. Say, okay, let me get this fixed. Live your life that way, not according to the world. The world, they treat their bodies like gold, like something so precious, and they worship themselves every day. They pamper themselves too much. They're stuck in the flesh. That's where they live. You're in this world, not of this world. You are in a temporary body, and that body will die, but you will not. Did you dedicate that spiritual house? Your body is a mechanism. Your body is a vehicle. How many of you dedicated that vehicle God gave you, called your body to the living God? How many said, Lord, this body is now yours. I, I desire to serve you in this body and indeed took a step to do something so that that body could carry out what you desire it to for the living God. You know, I did that. I did that a long time ago. And I'm, I'm telling you, some, some weird stuff happens. And that There's no way I should be among you guys like this. But see, I'm thankful. That's the difference. There are people in your life. And you say, well, if I got rid of these people, my life will be okay. Don't deceive yourselves. You get rid of those people that are pulling your life down. If it be three or four or five, guess what's going to happen? Three or four or five spirits will inhabit three or four or five other people. And they will be back in your life again. You can boot the spirit out of somebody who's harassing you. I can assure you that same spirit is going to come into your house and try to inhabit someone in your house. So how do, you, how do you defeat those spirits? With the word of God. You cannot do it with, you cannot defeat anything in the spiritual realm with your stuff. Your stuff is not going to work. You can defeat it through simple obedience. If darkness comes into your life, it's there because you left a big door open. So shut the door. That's all you have to do. Shut the door. If something is in your life like that, you, you've got a big door open. Shut the door. And how do you shut the door? you got to fix that leak in the roof. you got to get up there and fix it. That means there's something wrong internally. We already know it, and we refuse to fix it. We keep saying every day we don't fix it. We're saying, Lord, I love you, but I'm not fixing this. I'm going to keep doing it my way. But but I love you, Lord, but, but I'm going to do it my way. You ever meet somebody like that in your family, and you're very concerned about them? You're real concerned. And you say, hey, s s please try and stop. Stop doing this or that, please. So, so that you'll be okay because they're suffering. And they don't even know it. But when you see them suffering, you're the hurt one. You hurt over that person's suffering. But they refuse to change. And they look at you and they say, you know, I love you, but I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to stop doing this. That breaks your heart because you know the end result. You know the end result. The person cannot see what it's doing, but you can you can see what it's doing to the other person. And when that person says, I love you, but I'm not, I'm not going to stop this. It breaks your heart because you know what you perceive. You perceive no love in the words. You may even think in your mind, wow, that's how much you love me. That you would just continue to do what you're doing, knowing it's going to take you away from me. You don't even care. How can a person like that love anybody external? You know what it means? They may love you, but they love something else even more. I'll share this with you. If I had a condition, if somebody told me, well, Mike, uh, tell you what, I'm going to let you get to know these 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 uh, children right here. I was like, okay. And so I get to know the children. 20 years passes by. The same guy says, well, do you love those children? I say, yes. And the guy says, well, 
if you want those children to be okay because you're taking care of them, if you want them to be okay, you got to make a change. I'll say, well, why so? They'll say, well, because, you know, that food you're eating, you're going to die in six months if you don't change. Knowing those kids depend on me. Here's what people do in that scenario. Well, I'm going to die at some point. Might as well enjoy it. And they keep doing what they're doing. In six months, they're, they're, gone, they're done for. Not even knowing that because they're the provider of those children, those children don't have a provider now. They have nothing. So that person was complicit in those children having no guidance, nobody to come along and help them out. Here's my position. You ready? Even if I liked the foods I was eating, I never have a choice to make. It's either continue to serve my own likes or give all this up for their sakes. And I'll tell you something. When I love another person, I go to great lengths to do things they don't even know. I do. They don't even know what I'm doing. They'll swear them down I did nothing. They don't even know. Because if that if that were my choice, I'd take every food item. When that guy said, you got to stop eating so-and-so, I'd take every item and throw it out. I'd do everything I had to do with it, but it would never enter my body again. Because for somebody else's sake, somebody that I love, I'm willing to change it all. I can't do it for now. If I, if there was nobody else involved, and somebody came to me, and I'll have to admit this, and somebody said you're going to die if you keep eating that, I could find no cause to continue on. I couldn't. If I didn't love anybody, why then would I correct anything? That's the truth. I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this scenario because some of you, you have children. You just can't muster up the strength to walk away from certain things for yourselves. Stop looking at yourself. Stop thinking in worldly patterns and realize something. If you don't change it, you cannot fully support the people around you that you truly love. If you don't change it, they could potentially be hurt by it. Now, I don't know about you, but that's enough for me to muster up all the courage in the world to boot something to the side. We should all know by now to give up something just for yourself is difficult. It's not difficult when it's for love's sake. It's not difficult when somebody else hangs in the balance. See, it's not difficult then. You, you parents out there, you should be able to look at your children. That thing you've been trying to make a choice on, look at your kids. Are they not worth it? Because where would your kids be without you? What would happen to them if all of a sudden you were not here? Isn't that enough motivation to make a change? Somebody said they are so worth it. That's enough motivation to make a change. It really is. And I'm, I'll, I'll say it again. Finding the strength within me to do something. For me, I can never find the strength. But you let it be connected to somebody else and watch what happens. I'll try my best to move heaven and earth at the same time to make it happen. For love's sake. I can't do anything for Mike's sake. I can do it for love's sake. That's a big difference. Many of you are parents. Don't look at yourself anymore saying, am I worth, you know, how can I stop doing this? Am I worth, stop thinking about yourself. You have people around you that if you're not there, spiritual darkness will come in and destroy those same people. And you know it. You know it. You know if you're not on your feet, a spiritual darkness will consume those you love. You're the protective hedge around them. That's why you're there in the first place. It does not matter how that whole situation came about. You have become a spiritual hedge because you continue to believe. But if you get moved out of the way, there's nothing there to stop. And before you say, well, God will stop them by himself, look back in your own life and tell me that again. How many dark things got to you over the course of your life? If darkness did not get to you, not one of you would have entered into sin. Eve did not by herself enter into sin. She was beguiled. And that same thing happens every single day. People are beguiled and then they enter into sin. So how many of you are ready to walk away from those you love, to stop your spiritual protection? Don't point and say, well, God will protect them anyway. Don't that's why he put you there. Haven't we learned already that when the Lord does something, he does it through his creation called humanity? Haven't we seen that? God could have talked directly to every soul on earth. He didn't do that. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And then he sent the apostles. Now he's sending you. When the prophet didn't reach certain people, they simply didn't hear, did they? That's why it was important for the prophet to obey what the Lord said. Because they didn't hear anything until the prophet told them. And I'm telling you that you're in the same position. That's how God has things designed. But if you keep his word, 
that hedge stays up. How would God remind a person who's critical to somebody else that they're a hedge? Oh, he'd send them warning after warning. You know what God calls a warning in the Word of God? Trials, tribulations, specifically tribulations. Remember when he said to Israel, Why should I stricken you anymore? You'll just rebel more and more. So then, in, 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 in fact, when God sent droughts and plagues and disease upon his own people, that was God talking to his people to correct them. See, if you don't like that disease, you're going to make some life changes. That's what it was for. If you don't like plagues, you're going to make some life changes. That's what it was for. And you know what he said? They said they still harden their hearts and would not change their ways. See, a lot of people think trouble is somehow the devil doing to you whatever he wants to do wrong. He can't do anything to you he wants to do. He will do God's bidding in your life, meaning if God leaves the door open, he did so on purpose for Satan to come in there and begin to work that area that you refuse to. So you'll find, you know what? If a storm comes and you're standing in your kitchen and raindrops hit you in the face, that's when you turn around and say, oop, I left the window open. And then what do you do? You shut the window. Who stands there in the middle of a storm in their kitchen? The rain is blowing sideways. Their face is getting pummeled and hurt by rain. And they just take it. Refuse to shut. They won't shut the window. They refuse to shut the window. They just sit there and get hit upside the head with rain. Who would do that? Wouldn't that be ludicrous? Wouldn't that be crazy? That would be insane, wouldn't it? If you saw me do that, if you saw me standing in a building, a window was wide open, clearly it can shut, and hail was hit me in the side of the head, and I started just whining and crying and reaching for my head, saying, oh, it hurts so bad. You would look at me and say, he has lost his mind. What is he doing? All he has to do is shut the window. What is he doing? You wouldn't even want to help me, would you? You would not. You say, oh no, he's going to have to get blooded up before he learns. He's got to learn this lesson, so let it continue. See, in that case, that didn't make you cruel. You now realize, if you saw me in that predicament, you would realize, nope, Mike has to learn to shut the windows before the storm comes. In other words, you wouldn't rush to shut that window for me. Nope, you would not. You would say he knows how to shut the window. He just refuses to. So let the troubles continue. You would do that out of love, not out of hatred. You would not do that. Out, that's not hatred when you do that. That is L-O-V-E. Now for a small two-year-old, if one piece of hail hits a small child and you look over and you see that window open, you're going to jump over there with all speed to shut the window. That's what you'll do. You know why? Because the child doesn't know any better. The, the adult does. I know better, but the child does not. You shut the window for him quick without hesitation. But with me, you would look at me like something was wrong with me saying, oh my, he needs it. What? He can't survive this way doing stuff like that. Let the pummeling continue. That's exactly what you would do. That's what our father does. That's what he does. He does that and what do we do? We, we continue to persist in our own ways above his ways. You do it your way, you're going to get your results. How do you like them? At the worst time in my life, that very statement came into my heart one day. You persist to do it your way, Mike. How do you like the results? Do you not understand how stupid I felt? I mean, I heard that crystal clear. How do you like your results? You persist in doing it your way. How do you like the results? Sometimes we get so stubborn, we refuse to relent. Sometimes we're so prideful. Even in the face of full failure, we will sit there and say, nope, I know what I'm doing, when we do not. All of it happens over very minute and foolish reasons. In our lives, there are often things we know to do, but will not do. We simply won't do them. We know we ought to do them, but we won't. And then, just like me standing in a building with hail smacking me in the face, what if you saw me break down and start crying and then pray? Lord, please stop the hail. No, he's not going to stop it. He already made a way that I can be protected from it. I just refuse to use it. So what do you think will happen to me? I'm going to get pummeled hard. The hope would be the next time, the pain 
would be so grievous that I would never allow it to happen again that way. And come to find out if I fail to shut the window and if anybody were to look up to me or look to me for instruction or anything else, they would repeat the same activity. I could actually start spreading my own stupidity disease to other folks and then they would surely get hurt doing the exact same thing. See that? What happens though if I immediately snap out of my days and I go and shut the window? finally and the window breaks what do you think would happen if i finally snapped to my sense and i said oh i need to shut the window and i shut the window but the window breaks and the hail is still coming through see that's when god shows up if i had nowhere to go and i did exactly what the lord requires me to do being a good steward over it but it all broke down to pieces the father would intervene he would intervene he always will when you're obedient to the lord when you shut that window and you broke the window, looks like the window broke, your Father in Heaven will intervene. The hail, the pummeling, everything will stop. Healing will immediately come. Why? Because you're no longer resistive in that area. There's no need for correction. See, our Father is a good Father. He works by way of truth. He does not work with human qualities that we have. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So where we would say, you know, if we had the power to protect somebody and they shut the window when it broke, we would stop the hail if we could perceive it fast enough. But then when it came to the other portions, we said, well, you shouldn't have had it open in the first place. That's not how the Father works. In the Bible, it states that everything committed to the Lord is tried by His fire. Everything. You know what that means? When you say, Lord, I believe in your work, it's going to be tried by fire. Why? Because that's work. those works commended unto the Lord. That means every time you set forth in obedience, it will be tried. Listen, here's a key word. It's going to be tried to see if it be established for the living God or not. If it be established for the living God, nothing will halt it, no matter what comes. And the Lord will what? Restore the person following that after he tries it he restores the person many people don't have this knowledge because as soon as something happens they say lord get me out of this situation they're not learning they end up doing the same thing over and over again they feel defeated depressed all sorts of things they start to feel it's time to take action so that you're not sitting there saying oh i'm just a failure nope just stand up and start doing with what the lord has already given you that's when you see him that's when you recognize his hand. That's when deliverance comes. That's when the embrace comes. That's when he adds to the understanding you already have. That's when you grow. Growth will always come after you fully surrender.